we met briefly online uh, a couple of weeks ago and had a discussion that we got to try and compress to 20 minutes that we were on, the t on for at least an hour and could have gone for a lot longer. Um, just meandering through some of the, the challenges that are there for high-risk um, facilities. Now, the natural one that we moved into was was the nuclear side of stuff because we know it's a very heavily regulated industry and we looked at some of the challenges that we had there. So, Amma, what did you think about some of the discussion that we had on that? Good morning, everyone. Uh, lovely to be here and thank you for uh, allowing us to be part of the panel today. Uh, in terms of the nuclear industry, uh, it's definitely one of those industries that are quite fascinating, uh, filled with uh, very heavily regulated bodies and uh, it's been, uh, I guess it's been developed since back in the 1950s uh, and it's slowly transitioning into this side of the world now as we see in the United Arab Emirates and as well uh, hopefully soon in uh, Saudi Arabia as well. Uh, yeah, it's quite heavily regulated to, to your point uh, Bob but in terms of the uh, governance that exists um, what I would say is it's uh, quite prescriptive in nature uh, it's uh, uh, bounded quite a bit uh, which uh, obviously causes uh, um, a lot of uh, positives, but it also has its, its own negatives. It really depends how you look at it. In terms of the uh, uh, actual governances that uh, are associated with it, uh, what I would say is uh, when you look at it from a owner's perspective, it's great uh, in some instances because obviously you ensure uh, you have uh, very high levels of safety. Uh, you have a lot of redundancy and that obviously puts a lot of uh, um, comfort in your daily operations. Uh, when you look at it from a, a program manager, uh, if you are a um, uh, if you're part of a civil engineering department or you're part of a mechanical group or maybe refurbishment or potentially storage, different types of groups, they might find it a bit uh, too prescriptive and that causes them maybe some issues. So sometimes you tend to look for what I would say flexibilities. And I think that's where uh, in general fire life safety, that's where it's going. Uh, moving slightly away from the prescriptive nature of codes and standards and regulations into more of a maybe performance-based aspect to give a bit of uh, fluidity and flexibility uh, to help operations, help build more efficiencies, uh, and obviously as well uh, make our lives all easier, but as well safer in the same level. I'm going to work my way down the panel as we go because it's a nice easy progression for me. So Rob, have you anything to add to that? Yeah, so I agree with in terms of the fire life safety and kind of prescriptive measures that are kind of generally in place for nuclear. For fire and life safety, it's something that really needs to be embedded kind of from the ground up into it. Uh, you've got so many things to take into account when you look at nuclear facilities. You can't just rely on codes. You need to actually build in the prescriptive benefits to take into account security, radiological safety. And if you don't do that from the start, it costs so much money later on. So it's really, really important to involve kind of fire considerations as part of any kind of nuclear facility. Yeah, most definitely. Turkey. Sorry, <laughs> my, my mistake. So, Abdelaziz. Yeah, good morning, everyone. Uh, if I would like to add something, uh, it's very important that uh, one of the uh, risks associated, associated with nuclear or uh, fire safety in this sector, the insurance cost in case of any failure on these systems. Yeah, I think when we look at the nuclear industry, we all think about the, the catastrophic failures and there's obviously the ones that we're all aware of. Um, and I think that always sort of engenders people or, or energises people into thinking safety, safety, safety. But as you talk about, the ability to apply the codes in a pragmatic way, but pr still provide that, that safe outcome. And uh, Turkey, last but by no means least. Hello. Okay, good morning everyone. Uh, it's an honor actually to be with a distinguished uh, panel and an audience as we speak about fire programs and high uh, risk facilities. And as mentioned by my colleagues here, uh, I want to emphasize the importance of including fire protection aspects from an uh, early stage of feasibility study of initiating that project phase throughout the life cycle of the project uh, to make sure that cost versus benefit methodology that's been implemented to give you the most reliable and needed uh, fire system or programs within that facility. And 
that being said, implementing cost versus benefit uh, analysis methodology through your uh, life cycle projects will ensure that every salary real will spend for a measurable mitigation risk in that uh, facilities. Uh, second of that, I uh, would like to emphasize on the importance of uh, bringing up the leadership mentality and change that paradigm and shift it into looking into the power protection, not just as the compliance requirements and uh, regulation uh, obligation should be implemented, but as a strategic priorities to be considered in succeeding that project and uh, protecting the people lives and uh, safeguarding the future of the organization. Yeah, I think that's a very valid point you made there. When we design buildings, we build everything is safe until we put people in them. And then once we put people in the buildings, when they start to become unsafe because of our behaviours and our actions. And as, a, as facilities management, you know, um, one of the biggest challenges is, is educating the people of how to operate the built in a building and maintain the building in the right way. What have you got to say about that, Abdullah? Yeah. Uh, as you know, Saudi Arabia is uh, witnessing uh, rapid growth in uh, these sectors, especially in nuclear or uh, ESS technology. One of the challenge here is the lack of, uh, let me say, local uh, experience and the lack of uh, training for these people. So to address this uh, situation, I believe we have uh, two essential uh, action we must need. Uh, number one, uh, specialized training program for uh, these uh, sectors. So we need to educate uh, uh, local engineers or safety officers. Uh, second thing, which I believe is, uh, I believe it's very important, the knowledge transfer in project. So we must have contractual obligation between the uh, consultancy firm and the local uh, Saudis or local uh, professionals. Uh, with this, uh, and should be structured and recorded and tracked very well. Uh, in that case, we can have uh, a good education with uh, our local people. Um, it's a natural lead into you, really. Uh, again, we design all the fire life safety strategies and everything, and it's important that we collaborate throughout a project, and it's sharing that knowledge, sharing our thoughts and everything else. What have you got to think about that? Yeah, I, I agree totally. I think knowledge transfer is key. Um, record keeping is key as well. Uh, and uh, I think um, having uh, transparency in like, communication, uh, not just amongst team members, uh, but across the various organizations is, is vital for the success. Um, and something that we've seen quite often is uh, there is a growth of uh, open communication between parties. Uh, there is no shame of discussing items when um, you're not too sure of them. Um, if you need to get in experts, if you need to uh, knowledge transfer between various uh, uh, government departments, uh, that's, that's very important. That's how you grow. Um, and I think um, uh, with time, we'll, we'll see that develop even further, especially with uh, hopefully conferences like this, you can transfer that knowledge easier. Oh, I think you're exactly right. And again, no man is an island. Working in silos is a challenge because working in a silo, you don't take into account what's happening on the side of you. And when something fails, then that's a real challenge for us. Just one more item to add as well. I think that's what we've seen when you go back into the uh, discussion of disasters, right? Uh, it was people that were working by themselves and seldom, um, not reaching out, not really finding the solutions, trying to figure it out individually because they have, uh, as our previous pre presenter said, they have the qualifications, so they think they know the best. It's always open. It's always important to have that open conversation between the community. So, uh, yeah, I think that was very important. Okay. Rob? Yeah, yeah. just want to kind of add on to that. I think it's um, fantastic at the moment in terms of where Saudi is, in terms of actually being at a position of where knowledge transfer can be done quite readily and available. Um, it come up leaps and bounds in terms of knowledge that can be passed over without too much effort. Um, so I think that's yeah, a key junction at the moment for Saudi to get into that industry. Yeah, and last but not least, least. Uh, Total agree, they have covered it uh, very well, uh, including to the knowledge transfer is the training and awareness of the individuals. Uh, part of the knowledge transfer is a, a key success to ensure uh, safety and protection of the facilities. Yeah, we've kind of meandered through and we focused on like, the, the highly regulated nuclear as a, as a, a lead in. 
But look, let's look at new technologies. You know, EV, battery storage, battery gen generation, battery manufacture. What do we see as some of the key challenges there? I'm going to start down the line again. I'll start with Emma. You're starting with me every time. Oh, it's easy. I'm looking at <laughs> it. It's nice. It's a natural start. Uh, no, yeah. But um, new technologies um, um, definitely uh, being included in our daily activities. It's, it's everywhere now. Uh, EVs and, and uh, ESSs all across, uh, all across the region. Um, and I think uh, there is always that important discussion about uh, regulations, about codes and standards, and about technology. Are we trying to adapt or are we trying to develop and update our regulations and our uh, codes and standards to reflect the technology that we have? Or are we implementing the technologies ahead of its time, uh, hoping, hoping that the current measures are satisfactory uh, and sufficient to deal with the risks that are associated with this new technology? I think that, that is uh, a key part of any discussion that includes EVs and ESSs. And we're slowly seeing that transition quickly in terms of developing codes and standards. Yeah, I, I agree. But trying to keep the codes and standards up with technological advances is is, is almost a, a, a world of a, a pain because you just can't. People's brains and development is so good that codes and standards always come, come after. So, Rob? Yeah, no, I agree. It's like a chicken and egg situation at the moment. So technology advancing, especially for lithium-ion storage systems at such a high rate, the kind of technology and architecture goes into a battery may be suitable for maybe one fire protection measure, but will a different architecture then be suitable for that fire protection system? And at the moment, we don't know. Um, and until that develops to a point of where we can actually protect against maybe all of the measures, I think we're going to struggle. Yeah, what can I say here is, uh, as we are, we are, uh, are we are ready for adopting this new technology uh, and collaboration between uh, international bodies or uh, local bodies? We need to have more collaboration to understand and share the awareness among the uh, people here. Yeah, again, I think sharing knowledge is is the key, and we've been working all the way through, and I'll come to you Turkey on, on the EVs and the new technology what are your thoughts honestly you know we see the fire protection technology is evolving and developing uh, comparing to the risk challenges we are seeing in our uh, worlds now uh, I would say most importantly to select the main objective why we're selecting the technology are we preventing the fire from happening so we focus on that aspect or are we trying to control the fire after it happens? Or are we trying to extinguish? And I believe it's uh, better to prevent the fire than fighting the fire. So focusing on technologies that will prevent the fire from igniting it by itself uh, would be the more beneficial for the organization to focus on. I think uh, that, that again is, is a really key point. You know, the prevention of the ignition at the, or the failure that causes ignition is, is the key. Because if you think about the prevention, protection, then response, you know, those three elements and then recovery, because the moment there's been an incident, then obviously you've got the business challenges to recover. And a very small incident can have a significant impact on an organisation. And looking at all your experiences across the, the fire prote protection prevention, you know, it's embedded in you to try and stop it starting. And I think using technology to detect and prevent is, is key. When you um, can see your your itching there, Emma. <laughs> yeah, because you bring up a very good point in terms of uh, fire prevention. It's um, how do the facilities, how do the sites that hold these new technologies, whether it's EV, whether it's ESS, whether you go back to nuclear, how do you have a proper fire protection program or fire prevention program? And what elements does that entail? And how do you develop that to suit your needs uh, at your facility? I think that is, that is as well a very important point for us to to think about whenever you have, whenever you own a facility, what's your fire prevention program and what does that have in it? And it is very much, you, we take the consideration from the design stages of, a, of, a, of a, a building, an environment, you know, a facility, right the way through to the demolition, you know. And then within that life cycle of that property, we have to think about the the, uh, the the change out the changes the changes of a technology how do we how do we retrofit how do we include that development into our, our facility going forwards and some of those challenges 
and then thinking back about going right back to the regulated industry, um, the nuclear. How do we how do we withdraw that and make that safe at the end of it? How can we put something back into the environment? Thinking about building sustainability, product sustainability, and the fact that we are a finite resource in our in our natural resources. How do we think about those? Just a last little uh, thing as we. Again, you can see how easy it is for the time just to disappear. Um, so just, I'll leave that thought with you, um, but I'm gonna thank my panel. Hopefully, if there's any any questions, I'll take them quickly, um, but hopefully we just planted some seeds for you to, for them to grow and, and think about going forwards. So I'm gonna draw the, the panel to a close. Thank my, my esteemed colleagues, because at the end of the day, their knowledge in, in these areas is, is far greater than mine, and I've learned by standing up and just listening. So thank you very much indeed, gentlemen. Thank you.